You're listening to the Reversing Climate Change podcast by the team at Nori, the carbon removal marketplace. This is a show about the innovators and entrepreneurs developing solutions to climate change. Hello and welcome to the Reversing Climate Change podcast with Nori. I'm Ross Kenyon. I'm one of the co-founders of Nori and the creative editor here. Today, I have with me Todd Myers, Environmental Director at the Washington Policy Center. He's also the author of Time to Think Small, How Nimble Environmental Technologies Can Solve the Planet's Biggest Problems. Thanks for being here, Todd. Thanks for having me on. It's good to talk with you again. Yeah, it has been uh, several years since we have, and I'm happy to have you. Uh, Interesting book. A little bit of a contrarian take. I think people are so focused on what the UN is doing, what the federal government is doing for policy, that we lose track of what individual consumers can actually do. And in some cases, it's it's disparaged. Like one's individual carbon footprint is was a comms tactic of big oil to take responsibility off of their shoulders. And so this perspective has sort of fallen out of favor. It seems like you're trying to rehabilitate it some. Is that correct? Sort of, but I also think that there's new opportunities that didn't exist even just 10 years ago. Mm. And so what's interesting is, is that you say it's a contrarian take, but I think actually it's not a contrarian take when you actually look at what's going on in the real world. Lots of people are doing really cool things, small level, that are making a difference on the ground. But they don't get the attention. What gets the attention is the drama and the excitement of sort of the big stuff, right? The big meetings. While people are making really exciting progress on reducing the risk from climate change on the ground. So while I think it is contrarian in sort of the media circles, in environmental circles, I don't think it's contrarian. And that's why, you know, I am generally on the center right. But the foreword of my book was written by somebody who works for an organization called Wild Labs, which is funded by uh, World Wildlife Fund. So there's really a broad perspective, a broad agreement that these sorts of things can be meaningful, um, not just on climate change, but particularly on climate change, but on a lot of environmental issues. So I agree with you that it's not, it doesn't get, these approaches don't get the attention that they deserve. But that's why I wrote the book, because I think the potential is enormous for us to do things while politicians slug it out. That was maybe the biggest revealing of my own bubble bias (laughs) here that I've had on this show. I'm like, everyone talks about it in this one way. And it's nice to have a refresh. Maybe that is not actually uh, the gospel truth. And it's nice to zoom back out from there. Why do you think that is such a conventional piece of wisdom that needs to be challenged? How has this become so ossified? I think one thing is what's called proportionality bias. So proportionality bias says that big problems um, have big causes, big single causes. Often people think like this is what this is why people have conspiracy theories, right? It's it's that, oh, this big thing, COVID, uh, let's say, you know, must be caused by one big thing rather because it doesn't it doesn't seem rational that it's a lot a lot of little mistakes or a lot of little things that lead up to a big event in the same way it also makes us think that big problems only have big solutions that you that a lot of little things are not capable of aggregating into solving that big problem but actually when you look around at environmental problems the progress that we have made isn't single big solutions. It is often lots of little incremental bits of progress. If you look at air pollution, if you look at water pollution, and if you look at energy intensity, I mean, that's, I think, the the clearest one is the energy intensity of the economy. It is a constant downward trend. There are no big drops. It's just bit by bit by bit. And that seems counterintuitive that lots of small things can add up to big impacts. So I think that's why we focus on it, on big solutions. The other thing is, is that there is a sense of crisis, right? You you don't, you feel like time is running out. And if you feel like time is running out, you want to rush. You want to do it as fast as you can. And, you know, incremental evolutionary solutions don't seem up to the pace of the problem. But again, a million little things are often more effective and more uh, and often faster and more reliable than putting all of our eggs into a few baskets that we think are necessary because and what we've seen is if you don't get the results you want on one or two big things 
Now you're really in trouble. Now you're really behind the curve. And so a diversity of solutions is often a better approach than a few big things. I wonder if part of it too is it's just an easier story to tell if you can point to the Apollo program or the Marshall Plan or some of these big national projects that we've undertaken. It at least, um, there's a coherence to it and it's very easy to wrap your head around it. Whereas, you know, thousands of incremental changes, how do they yeah. even tell it? Uh, like your, your book is a massive set of small stories as it probably should be, but it's harder to tell a, a simple version of it. I could tell you 10 different micro stories that all add up to something. Yeah, Who's got time for that, Todd? Isn't the Marshall Plan to be here? <laughs> well, and I think the Apollo program kind of uh, screwed up our mindset uh, oh. because we think, um, oh, we'll just, we'll just do an Apollo moonshot. There's actually a, a prize called the Earthshot, which is right after the moonshot. Um, designed to solve environmental problems, and they just came out with their winners. But if you look at the winners, what's so interesting is they're not moonshots. They are small, local projects. Projects can be scaled up, no doubt, but they are small projects. And the one thing I remind people about the Apollo, using the Apollo going to the moon as a metaphor is, they chose to go to the moon. They didn't choose to go to Pluto. <laughs> Right. So they chose something that was difficult, but achievable rather than trying to do something that was completely, you know, impossible or um, extreme. And too often I hear uh, the Apollo example used as a justification to try to do things that are extremely unlikely, that are very that are very high risk, very low uh, chance of success. And that is the wrong lesson that we should be learning from that. So I think it is always good to stretch, to push, to try to find new ways to innovate, but putting all your eggs in one basket and setting targets that are unreachable is not the way to get there. Trying lots of different things, engaging innovation. And thanks to the ubiquity of technology, we now have more opportunity than ever to do those sorts of things. And that's why I included so many examples in my book, because people are skeptical. They say, okay, Todd, that sounds nice in theory, but show me where it works. And I wanted to show in lots of ways, it's already working. I think part of it is also that people get ensorcelled by economies of scale. And I see this with single payer healthcare debates too, where they get so focused on the cost savings of increased bargaining power of the state versus uh, medical providers. And they focus on those savings without focusing on what's being lost when you have like one enormous one size fits all policy for an entire country. Like, are you going to lose some of the nimbleness that makes the healthcare, the parts of it that work? Is that, are those still going to work at that scale? I don't see a lot of concern for that. <laughs> well, let me first say I was ensorcelled once and I limped for a week. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, I, you know, the nimbleness is really important because the types, the nature of the problems change. And of course, nothing is ever static. All of these systems are dynamic. The, the environment is dynamic. Human society is dynamic. And so if you have government programs that are essentially static, um, their ability to address problems quickly and adapt is very low. Now, I say that as somebody who's worked at a government agency. I worked at the Department of Natural Resources. I currently sit on the Puget Sound Salmon Recovery Council trying to recover salmon. I don't denigrate the good work that government can do where it's appropriate, but it is not always appropriate. And the other thing is, is that in the 1970s, when we turned to government for the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and those sorts of things, it was entirely appropriate. The types of problems that we faced then were very well suited to those regulations. And what we saw was success. We see much cleaner air, much cleaner water today as a result, and we ought not dismiss that. But we have more opportunities today using technology to engage individuals and small groups in ways that can make a difference. We just couldn't do that 50 years ago. So it makes no sense, especially given the magnitude of the challenge that we have in climate change, not to engage all of those different opportunities and to maximize them. And even if you believe that government must lead, you still should say that technology and individual efforts should fill in the many, many gaps that are left behind by government. And I think that is something that everybody on all sides of the, the, the political spectrum can agree on. 
You tell the story in the book very well, and maybe it's worth retelling here, but why were the pollution problems of the 70s that were addressed by the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act, why were those policy successes and how is what we're facing now different? Yeah. So in the 1970s, what you faced, the primary with clean air and clean water, the primary problems that you faced were big smokestacks and big outfalls, right? Everybody thinks of the Cuyahoga River catching on fire. So government can target a limited number of identifiable sources of pollution. The same was true with sulfur dioxide and acid rain. And they could go to those and say, we need you to cut your pollution by this amount, by this date and using a variety of different regulations and market forces and things like that. It's very successful because government can leverage its power to stop large sources of pollution in the way that individuals simply can't. So it was really a, a, an appropriate application of uh, government regulation. Um, and like I said, it was successful. But the problems that we face today are not the same. They're not a few sources. They are not always identifiable. There are many, many distributed sources. If you're thinking of climate change, you're thinking of everybody who uses, drives a car, uses electricity, uses, you know, heats their home. I mean, all of these sources. Of, I mean, there's so many sources of CO2 emissions. It's not just climate change. It's things like Plastic pollution, right? Plastic pollution into the ocean. It is impact on species, lots of little impacts on their habitat, right? Think the monarch butterfly, where they want to use lots and lots of private land, and it's there's no single impact on the monarch butterfly that is harming their habitat. It is loss of milkweed across a large area. So now you have a very different nature of a problem that's very distributed that is less suited to the types of solutions we had in the 1970s. And it's not me saying that. It's not just me saying that. It's also uh, Bill Rockleshouse, who was the first director of the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, in a piece he wrote about a decade ago for the Wall Street Journal, he said very clearly that the types of solutions that we had in the 1970s are not suited to the problems we have today because of the dis distributed nature of the problem. The good news is we can access distributed solutions by using technology to aggregate the efforts of lots and lots of individuals, lots of small organizations to add up to those big environmental benefits and solve those problems in a way that is more suited to their nature, which is that they, you know, there is no single point source. You have many examples in the book too of environmental nonprofits being technology developers now of trying to engage what yeah. used to be, you know, citizen science and now trying to make an app that serves, it almost is like, a, it's mimicry, right? <laughs> in, a, in a biological sense, you're like, hey, this is a great bird watching app. Also yeah. you're saving birds and maybe you don't even know about it or care, but hey, yeah. it's doing good things. Is that an example of something like this? So it's a nice little twist. Yeah, that's exactly right. So uh, there's two along those lines. One is a, an app called iNaturalist. If people don't have iNaturalist, they should get it. It is amazing. Hmm. Um, if you are ever out hiking and you're wondering what a plant is, what a bug is, what a, you know, whatever, you can literally just take a picture of it and it will use artificial intelligence to tell you what it is. And if it can't identify it using AI, it will send it out to the community and somebody will say, will identify it for you based on what it looks like and where the location is. So many people have turned in their photos to this. They now have another app called Seek, where in real time, you point your camera, you open the app, you point your camera at a plant, and in real time, it will tell you what that plant is. It's amazing. But that started, iNaturalist just started not as a tool for scientists, but as a tool for individuals who wanted to know more about the world around them and engage them, right? I love going out into the wilderness, but botany, I do not have the patience for botany. Uh, I'm right, I cannot remember all of those various plants and the names. I don't have to anymore. Now I can use iNaturalist and it connects me. But so many photos have been turned in that like dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of scientific studies have now been created using that data. Wow. But it didn't start as a scientific tool. It started as a consumer tool, as a, as a tool for individuals to learn about the nature around them. The other app uh, is eBird, 
If people are birders, they've probably already heard of eBird. And then Merlin Bird ID. Both of those apps are from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. The great thing about eBird is, is that it's for birders so that they can say what birds they've seen, where they saw them, keep their life list. But they now have so many points of data that the data are being used to understand the migratory patterns of birds and see how it changes over time, right? related to climate change, related to temperature changes and things like that. But it's also being used to identify critical pieces of habitat to protect migratory birds. And so in California, they actually used eBird data to identify which parcels of uh, rice paddies of, of that rice farmers had could be used along the path of migratory bird routes. And they went to those farmers and offered to pay them to flood their fields in January and February to create uh, what they called pop-up wetlands. It was sort of like Airbnb for birds. So when the birds came through, they had good habitat and then they moved along and the farmers benefited because they got paid, the birds benefited. So that's the power of these tools, but the tools are were first about helping users and second, using the data that they put in for scientific and conservation purposes. One way of understanding that is that there's a distributed network for finding data, creating data, but the decision-making that is resulting is still at this policy level that sounds a bit more centralized. Is that correct? Well, both is true, right? I mean, I think especially in the case of citizen science and the, and the examples I just gave, right, you're aggregating data, you're taking lots and lots of distributed data and aggregating it so that you can make a centralized decision so that you can use it in one place to make either good policy decisions or take actions or things like that. But you also see the opposite, which is, is that apps allow people to do individual things, which then are multiplied by lots of little um, actions that lead up to big things. And I'll give you I'll give you an example that's not in my book, but is more recent and related to energy. In California, when they had their energy crisis this summer, so much of our energy focus is on the supply side. What are we going to build more wind? Are we going to build more solar? Are we going to build more batteries? Those sorts of things. But not enough of it is on the demand side. So when California was facing their blackouts this summer, they sent a text out to residential customers and said, look, we're facing blackouts. Please conserve where you can. Within 15 minutes, demand had declined by 2,000 megawatts, which was equivalent to the entire amount of battery power that was being used in the state at that time. <laughs> so you think about how much we've spent on battery storage in California. And with one text, you were able to replicate that just by people finding ways to conserve. Uh, there are lots of other ways to do that, which is smart thermostats, which use artificial intelligence to shift demand outside of peak hours so that you're using electricity when it is not only lower cost, but lower carbon intensity. And then I have in my home a thing called a sense monitor, which is hooked up to my electric panel, which tells me exactly how I'm using electricity, where I should be conserving, where I'm wasting it so that I can, again, reduce the amount of electricity. My use of smart thermostats, my use of sense, when somebody texts and says, you know, turn off your lights, all of those things are small. My turning off my lights doesn't do much for the global grid. But if lots of people do it, now we're to a point where we're, we're avoiding blackouts as they did in California. So as you say, it, 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 this works in both directions, right? In some cases, it is aggregating data for a centralized purpose and centralized decision. In other cases, it is distributing the power so that individual people can take actions that add up to big environmental benefits. I like those examples too, because one of them is moral suasion, the text saying, hey, please help, please be altruistic, please conserve your consumption or decrease it. And the other one, presumably you are also seeing the cost savings by not purchasing peak load power yep. and such, and you were seeing those savings. Which of those is more effective? When should which be used? How should we think about those? Well, they both are. There's been a lot of talk about doing things on electricity bills where you say you are using more than your neighbors and things like that. And what the research shows is that those work. For those very, 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 very shame based. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and they are very shame based and that they work for a period of time. But I actually in my book outline research that compared the two. 
And one was just moral suasion, just encouraging people to do the right thing. And there's no doubt that that works. People spend money to buy electric vehicles or other things like that, that they know the additional cost is going to be more than they are going to save in gasoline. But they do it because it's a cool car and because they want to do something to reduce CO2 emissions. But if you can add on top of that a financial incentive, then you do two things. First, what the research shows is that it's, that it lasts longer, that the impact on people remains, that they don't sort of give up, that they continue to find ways to reduce energy and save money. So um, it is more permanent. Second, now you start to engage people who don't really care about climate change or think it's exaggerated or whatever, right? If you tell somebody who thinks climate change is a hoax that they can save money, they're going to save money. And so that becomes a way to broaden the circle of people who will take action to reduce environmental impact. When you get to the point where people are doing good things for the environment, either without knowing or caring, then you're really starting to make progress. Our, our political solutions rely on people agreeing, a majority of people agreeing that we must take action. But as we see, that changes, right? Republicans ju just took control of Congress. So what is going to happen for the next two years? Anything meaningful? Probably not. So if your strategies to help the environment are contingent on you winning every election, you are in big trouble. If your strategies for helping the environment engage people who disagree with you politically, but benefit personally from taking actions for the environment, now that's truly sustainable in the truest sense of the word, in that you can sustain it over long periods of time. Why does that feel so icky to so many people? I think it could be uh, an American missionary relic that we want to convert people, that we want to change their hearts and minds rather than paying them to care about something. I think it feels inappropriate too. The example I've often used on the show has been if a parent said, I'll give you $20 to respect your father, you, know, <laughs> you, you, you would view this as a category error. You should not be paying for this thing. It's wrong for intrinsic reasons. And I think if a lot of people, maybe that's why it feels icky. Is there, is there more that we're missing? Uh, how important should that ickiness really be here? I understand that. But I also think that, I think one of the problems that we face is that in politics, people across the political spectrum and this I think is becoming worse, is that people, people's politics are wrapped up in their identity, that they see themselves as environmental activists or on the right as patriots or things like that. And if you say to them, the things you are doing are not effective, or you need to engage people who are not patriots uh, or who are not who don't care about the environment, um, it, it seems like an attack on your identity because what you're now saying is, is that it's not that important that you care about the environment to do good things. And people want to feel like when I do something for the environment, I'm doing something good. I understand that, right? I, this is my, I've been working on this for 22 years. I care very much about helping the environment, but I think if our personal identity gets too wrapped up in what environmental policies we support, we are missing gigantic opportunities to help the environment in so many different areas. And so that's what I would encourage people is, if you promote a policy and it feels really good to promote it, you might wanna think about whether you're too personally invested in that policy and whether it is about making you feel good or about helping the planet. Wow, what a deflating idea. Well, no, it shouldn't be deflating. It should oh, be freeing, good. right? I mean, that's the thing is, is that I think we put these constraints on ourselves about what is allowable. And I think that when you get rid of those constraints and start to look and say, you can, you can start to see all sorts of opportunities. Like I said, that's one of the reasons that I, look, I'm on the center right, and my book is full of people who are on the left who are doing cool things. And if I had fixated that these people are disagree with me on some fairly fundamental issues that I think are important, I would have had a hard time writing this book and recognizing how cool this stuff is. So it's not easy. I admit that. But I think 
can be liberating. And then once you start to look around a little bit, you see a lot of cool stuff that you might not have noticed before. Yeah, I like this idea and I'm I'm fairly sympathetic to it. There are cases though where it makes me feel bad. And I got this example from Brian Kaplan, who's an alum of the show, about how we should consider paying dictators to step down and have immunity. Like if you go to Kim Jong-un and say like, what's it going to take? You can live out your life in Switzerland. Your family will be fine. But North Korea turns into a democracy. That would probably be a pretty great deal and would eliminate an enormous amount of suffering. And there is some amount of money that it is probably worth pursuing. But I think we would all feel pretty terrible about it. Here you go, Kim Jong. Here's here's a billion dollars for being a horrible dictator. Yeah, that doesn't feel great, but I think you you know make a good point is is that if the end result is that millions of people's lives are better and are liberated, might be worth it. I try not to think, you know, I, I hope that telling people that they can save money and energy isn't like paying Kim Jong un. <laughs> I hope that that's not the literally uh, the, the exact same here. God. The exact but, same. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah, I you know I think it is it, it sort of stretches the bounds of the analogy that sometimes to be most effective you have to work with people who you might not agree with and actually think are are, are doing things for the wrong reasons. There are constant fights about this, and if you haven't noticed this before and you're listening, you'll start seeing it everywhere. And another place I've seen this a lot is about paying for plasma and donating blood and whether or not paying people to donate crowds out the altruists who do it just because and how big are the magnitudes here. And even if it doesn't matter for the for uh, like instrumental reasons, is it still wrong to be paying for bodily tissue in this way? And I think I would support the idea that does this get the job done? Does it help the people? I feel like symbols are less valuable than people and getting fixing climate change or making sure someone who needs regular blood fluids has them, I think, right? If the alternative is the problem doesn't get solved, it shouldn't matter if there's some sort of semiotic issue lingering, I think. Do you agree with that in general or no? Give you an analogy that goes back to one of the things we discussed with which is eBird. So we we talked about eBird and that you know the purpose of eBird and the and the bird watching app was to reward individuals for you know give them an app that they could keep their life list so that they had something of value, right? So putting data into eBird helped them independent of whether it was used for science or anything like that it helped them. But then you got all these scientific data. But they also going back to your moral suasion They also talk about how the data are used and encourage people to do it, to promote science, and people certainly do that. And then they also do gamification, which is they have roadside bias, which is where people are seeing birds in areas that are easy to get to. But sometimes you want data in the areas that are not so easy to get to so that you know what's going on. And so they would do games where they would say, okay, if you look, if you can identify birds in these areas, then you will get certain amount of points. And if you get points, then we'll give you a hat um, or things like that. So, and then, you know, you're on the leaderboard. So now you engage that sort of personal, you know, competitive spirit and things like that. And that sense, and again, the sense that you and I are talking about, which is that I'm doing a good thing, that I am helping science and research and filling in these gaps And even if I don't get a hat, if I'm just at the top of the leaderboard or, you know, among the top of my region, those things are important. So I don't, I'm not trying to just take a green eye shade view of the environment where you have a sort of a ledger on one side and the other about, okay, what, what are we willing to pay? I definitely want to engage people like you and I, who at a fundamental level care about the environment and are willing to spend our own money and and do things to help the environment rather than benefit from it. But if we can add other people who are more interested in saving money than reducing CO2, now, I mean, now that starts to build on itself. It multiplies our efforts. So I think that's the power, again, getting back to the power of the diversity of these tools is, is that engage both of those things and doesn't have to choose one or the other. We used to talk about this all the time, especially because Nori, uh, my company, was we started working with uh, farmers engaging in regenerative agricultural practices, and many of them did switch 
for practical purposes. There are lower capital costs, less less fuel needed, different kinds of, of equipment needed. And uh, this could result in cost savings for them if done appropriately. And we were seeing that this was a great way to engage people who are traditionally from a more right of center background who may not be as keen on climate change to actually do something that would benefit them and uh, the rest of us at the same time. And also not require finger wagging, you know, it's carrot, it's not stick. And this is a way to engage people. I think maybe that's a good generalization too. Are are there any stick examples even in your book? I feel like most of them are carrots. Am I right? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the other thing is, is that I think that technology can make the sticks more stickier. (laughs) That's not how that word works, but okay. (laughs) Yes. But you get my point, which is. You know, one of the things, on the, in the case of climate change, one of the things that we constantly focus on is is the right. If you're going to tax CO two, is putting the right price on CO two to get the reaction that you want. So that people, okay, we have to put it at fifty dollars a metric ton, so that people will reduce this amount. What the challenge to that though is, is that you want people to be able to recognize the the price signal. And respond to it. When gas goes up 10 cents a gallon, everybody in the world knows it because it is on every street corner. If your price per kilowatt hour went up by 10%, people might not realize it because they don't, it's hard to discern from your monthly bill. Um, you don't there's it's very difficult so the infor- the lack of information transparency is a barrier to using price signals in some cases hmm. but there is all even independent of a carbon price there is a price signal on energy it costs you to use energy and the more transparent you can make that price the more that you can get a response from people to those prices. So what you do is you increase the elasticity of demand by uh, making people uh, see those prices more clearly. You, if you can do for electricity and for you know environmental impact what we've done for gas prices, you don't need to raise carbon prices to $200 a metric ton to, you know, beat people really hard with a stick. You can take, you can have a smaller carbon price and it will be more impactful. It will seem like a bigger stick because it is more transparent. Wow. I've never had it framed in terms of elasticity, but yeah, I also, I look at my energy bill. It kind of comes out like every two months, I think I get it. And I have no way of knowing like which days or yeah, the transparency is not present. And I think I'm like, reasonably well educated and involved in these things and i still find it hard to know so something is broken yeah. there for yeah, sure simply giving people information helps them make those decisions um, or in the case of smart thermostats using artificial intelligence which can monitor prices for you and monitor carbon intensity if you choose to do that it does it for you so you don't have to monitor it. But on the other hand, we are now to a point where technology is so powerful that we can have instantaneous responses to things. So for instance, in the UK, there is a utility called Octopus Energy that they have a, a program um, called their Fan Club. And the Fan Club is for communities that are near a wind turbine that is owned by Octopus Energy. And when the wind turbine is running, it will tell you. And if you use electricity, then your prices go down. And if there is particularly high level of wind and a lot of wind energy, prices go down even further. So think about that, how instantaneous that is. We go from getting a bill once every two months in your case, where you sort of try to figure it out, to now being able to know what your prices per kilowatt hour are instantaneously because a wind turbine is generating excess electricity. That's where we are right now. And we have only just begun to take advantage of these things. I like those two options. I think in the medium to long term, I think the AI one's going to be more powerful, primarily because I just, I have a million things to think about all day long. Do I have the cognition to spare for eking out like small little gains in my uh, kilowatt hours? I feel like I'd rather that be automated. I'm busy, damn it. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah, that's and that's exactly right. So the, I mentioned that I have this thing in my uh, electrical box called the Sense Monitor that connects to my the wires into my house, and it detects the amount of electricity um, coming into my house a million times a second. Oh my! So that it can use artificial intelligence to identify the unique electrical signals of each appliance in my house. So it will look at it and say, oh, I know what that is. That's a light bulb. Oh, I know what that is. That's your dryer. That's your washing machine, things, whatever it is. And then it will tell you, okay, here's how much electricity you're you're using right now because your dryer is on. And over the last week, here's what you've been using. So this week, it's been cold where I live and I got a notification uh, from Sense on my phone that said, you have just reached your peak electricity demand for the last however many months, which doesn't <laughs> surprise me because it's been it's been cold where I live. So, but it, it it tells me that. So now I'm like, okay, I need to think about how is there a way that I can you know adjust my thermostat or do something to reduce that, or is it just really cold outside? And that's just the way it is. But again, I don't have to monitor it every second. It does it for me and then gives me a little notification that says, hey, you're using a lot of, a lot of electricity. You may want to think about it. Hmm. While I have you, Todd, I'd love to get some uh, free business advice for the <laughs> carbon removal community. Yeah. Because I think this is a legacy of just companies that have done amazingly well uh, in various tech boom times. Um, everyone wants to be a unicorn and then some. Everyone wants to be the Google of carbon removal, to be synonymous with it, to be an enormous company, the marketplace that moves lots and lots of units. I mean, Nori is susceptible to this too. That's part of our vision. Are we wrong to be thinking in this commodity scale way? I feel like that can do a lot of good. Or how might you contextualize it to uh, take the best of your learnings from this book? So let's take two scenarios. Scenario number one, which is, is that you continue to do the work that you're doing at about the scale that you're doing it. It's meaningless. Absolutely not. Right. You are making a real impact. You are helping some farmers earn some revenue that they wouldn't have otherwise. You are helping companies and other folks. Uh, you just did an amazing uh, deal <laughs> uh, that you are going to, that's going to help you become even bigger. But if you stay basically the same size, you are making a real impact. And if there are a thousand other Norries out there, the combination of what you're doing and what they're doing is going to be helpful. And others will learn from you and improve upon it. You will see them as competitors, but the world will see that as progress <laughs> um, uh, because they will get better uh, thanks to you. The other also, so that's one scenario. So great. You're doing that. It may not be all that you had wished for, but you have made the world a better place. Now let's say that you, uh, the combination of your accounting systems, your technology for sequestering carbon, all of those things can be universally applied and you take off. And now you become really big. Three years from now, you won't return my calls. Well, that's fantastic too, but it doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, obviously you wanna make the biggest impact you can where applicable. But I just, I think that the mindset that everything has to scale or it's not very meaningful is not a useful mindset. A lot of environmental problems are localized. A lot of environmental opportunities are small, but they are still meaningful in their own way. And the beauty of technology is that things that we couldn't do before because the overhead costs of doing those uh, small things were so high, it wasn't worthwhile to do the small things. Now the overhead costs are extremely low thanks to technology. And so doing small things now makes sense because uh, the costs are so low and the benefits, albeit small, are still much larger than the costs. So it just changes that whole cost analysis. So I've known you guys for a while. I wish you all the best. I, I think that the, the, the new deals that you've done have put you on a really cool path, but it's taken you a while to get here. And if you had never done that, you still would have played a very productive role in being a part of the community that is fighting CO2 emissions. Well, thanks for the kind words. I'm trying to read you back to yourself a little bit. It sounds like 
I mean, there's a version of what you're saying that small is beautiful. And that's like a Wendell Berry kind of vision. And that's not what I hear you saying. It sounds more like subsidiarity where things should grow to the scale at which they can be addressed and no bigger and no smaller. And the focus has been bifurcated between those, right? It's like huge scale or like super local and do everything local. And you're saying it just needs to fit the problem appropriately. Is that right-ish? Yeah, that's absolutely true. But And then the second thing is, is that we now have more opportunities to find that right scale than we did before, because a lot of things that were worth addressing, that were worth um, uh, taking on, we just didn't have the ability to do that because the cost of addressing them didn't scale well, right? It was either it was either a bunch of people volunteered to go and help your park, or it was we need a government program <laughs> that, that addresses this. And the in-between part was really hard. And now the in-between part is not that hard. It's much easier. And there are lots of cool things that are able to fulfill that more broad spectrum of um, environmental actions. Okay, you have my permission to talk about Ronald Coase now. You can. <laughs> It's, it's all transaction costs, right? All the way down. Yes. Well, and that's it. So we talked about the fact that I give a lot of examples. And the reason why I give a lot of examples in my book is because um, when I talk about theory, people say, okay, Todd, that's, that's really cool, but show me where it works. And so I actually, it was funny. One of the earliest reviews of my book was that uh, you will be overwhelmed with information, <laughs> which I thought was a kind of funny critique, but I did that on purpose because the one thing I didn't want people to say was sounds good in theory, but not in practice. But I do try to say, look, that there is a reason that there is a, there are theoretical reasons why these things are happening, why we are seeing these emerge. And one of them is, is that technology reduces transaction costs. It reduces the cost of coordination and information. And that is Ronald Coase, as you mentioned, who won the Nobel Prize in economics for his work on transaction costs, what it takes people to collaborate, why they choose to collaborate in a company, why they choose to outsource, how you allocate One of his famous papers is on how you allocate the costs of environmental harm, right? If you have a a factory that has smoke that is impacting a whole community, how do you allocate those costs? We now can solve those types of problems because of information technology in a way that we just couldn't a long time ago. One of my favorite examples of just how low transaction costs, costs are is if I said, okay, take a room of 100 people and say, okay, I'm gonna buy you all pizza, but you have to tell me exactly what kind of pizza you want and exactly how much you're gonna eat. And you, and you have to you know, come up with that. All 100 of you have to come up with what kind of pizzas I should buy. People will say, okay, that's fine. We can do it. It'll take a while, but we can do it. And I say, okay, now you have 30 seconds to do it. Well, there's no chance, right? I mean, <laughs> you can't even get five people to agree on what pizza they want <laughs> in 30 seconds. But if I have an app that says, okay, how many pieces of pizza do you want? What toppings do you want? You can put it in in 10 seconds. And now within 30 seconds, I can have an entire pizza order for a room of 100 people with exactly what they want. It's sort of a silly example, but it is an example, an everyday example of how reducing transaction costs can solve problems that were previously very difficult and make them very simple. Even if it's a, even if it's a very straightforward problem, which is just coordinating what everybody wants, the fact that you can do it so much more rapidly with information technology makes all the difference. Do you have a sense of what the appropriate relationship should be with the private sector and government? I feel like that's probably a question that's so big that it's almost antithetical from the ethos in which you wrote this book. Because that's like, is that way too general a question? Should we even be talking like that? I think it varies. What, yeah. what you see is some of the best innovations in my book and around the world are occurring in places where government action is simply not an option. You know, and I, I tell a story of one city, and I think it's the capital of Ghana, if I remember it correctly, where they were having power outages regularly. And, and the hardest thing was to figure out what was causing the power outage. And people don't think about this in the United States, but um, utilities up until fairly recently in the last decade or so, the way that they knew that they had a power outage is that people would call. They, did, they couldn't detect it. Now that we have smart meters, they can do that. But up until very recently, people calling was the way. 
So if you're in you know, Ghana or something like that, detecting power outages is very difficult, especially if they're very frequent. So a group at, at Cal Berkeley created an app. And so if your phone was charging and was connected to Wi-Fi, and suddenly lost a charge and suddenly lost the Wi-Fi, but it wasn't moving, right, so that you didn't unplug it and take it with you, it would send a signal, a ping, to the utility to tell them, hey, I think the power's out. And if that utility all of a sudden got 20 pings in one area, they would go, okay, power's out in that area, right? All it took was an app. Uh, it didn't take installing smart meters and things like that. Super low cost, uh, very simple uh, application of technology. In the United States, the route that we went was spending literally billions of dollars to install smart meters. <laughs> so in some cases, the best and the most clever solutions or were government options aren't even available, um, where the only thing you have is to find clever ways to apply the technology. So uh, to your question about what is the proper balance between private and government, it depends. But the beauty of these small technologies is, is that they are so adaptable and the solutions are so diverse is that no matter what level where you have a very high level of government engagement like you do in the West on environmental issues or where you have very low level of government engagement on environmental issues in developing countries, there are solutions that can address those problems. And, and there are lots of really cool examples. Are there places that you see now, even in the United States, where government action has crowded out what might have emerged otherwise that may, in fact, be better? How long you got? Um, <laughs> I think the easiest is, is that in electricity, um, a lot of the things, interesting things that utilities are doing across the country to incentivize people to use technology and to have options to buy electricity that is lower carbon and things like that aren't available in Washington state because of the way our utilities are structured. Our utility, our tariffs are structured and our utilities are structured in a way that was basically set in the late 1800s. And in other parts of the country, and I just gave an example in the UK around the world, there are lots of really innovative things that are engaging people, both who care about the environment and both who are looking to save money to reduce their carbon emissions. In a lot of those cases, we simply don't have those options here in Washington state because, and not just Washington state, other states as well, because of the way our utilities are, are structured. So I tell a story in my book about one organization that was trying to provide uh, renewable energy, getting people to invest in renewable energy and then having them benefit from it. And they said that the biggest problem they had was trying to get the regulatory approval for what they were doing. When they started it, they were on the leading edge. And actually, I think Wired Magazine called them one of the most you know, innovative companies in the sector. And a year later, they were gone because they couldn't, because of the regulatory barriers. So there are lots of cool ideas that people have, technology that is available that are being slowed down because they are at odds with our current regulatory system. Those stories are really hard for people to understand because they're so often counterfactual. There's like the thing that would have existed never emerged because it couldn't. And then people don't see that. And then they just assume that it never existed in the first place. I think, is that happening? Is that one of the reasons why there isn't a larger upswell against regulation that may be stifling innovation? I think it's also, I think it, it's also theoretical, right? Hmm. What you're telling people is, to your counterfactual point, this could happen. Well, it's sort of intangible. And it's, you know, it's like you're facing something that you that is very tangible, which is the risk from climate change, and saying, trust me, I have this very intangible solution. <laughs> That's a hard sell sometime. So I get that. So what I ask people to do is not, you know, to put all their eggs in one basket or put, you know, just rely on hope, but to say, let's just open the space. Let's, let's open, let's create these opportunities. Let's remove barriers so that if these things are out there to emerge, that they will, let's let them. That doesn't mean tearing down everything else. That doesn't mean uh, that I'm an anarchist and that we ought to get rid of all government. It just simply means that make sure that there are opportunities for these new innovations to solve these problems in ways that we're not thinking about right now. So 
it doesn't have to be an either or, but we do need to take a good look at ways that we are not being accommodating to the innovation, which has so much opportunity and so much promise to address climate change and other issues. And if you're listening and you'd like some examples of where that might be taking place, you can pick up a copy of Time to Think Small, How Nimble Environmental Technologies Can Solve the Planet's Biggest Problems by Todd Myers. Thanks for being here, Todd. Thank you very much. It's always nice to chat with you. Yeah, it was very fun. Thanks so much for listening. If you like what we do here, please give us a great rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Tell a friend. And hey, thanks so much for listening to the show today. Thank you so much for listening. If you could please subscribe and give us a great rating and review on Apple Podcasts or a rating on Spotify, that'd be much appreciated. It helps us get our content out to more people. You can sign up for our newsletter at nori.com, follow us on social media, and we will catch you next time.